Good afternoon and welcome everybody. Um, this is our one year anniversary of Carter Conversations. We've been doing these uh, conversations uh, every month, typically the fourth Saturday of a month um, for a year. And last year we were lucky enough to do the feature North Brentwood community. And so today we're delighted to be able to welcome the Lakeland community folks. Um, Carter Conversations is um, composed of the local villages, and that would be Hyattsville Aging in Place, Helping Hands from University Park, and Explorations in Age on Aging and Neighbors Helping Neighbors in College Park. And we try to, um, certainly during the pandemic, and I presume we will continue this, um, we tried to expand engagement and social activities even though we couldn't be face to face and it really has worked out very well for the for the year um, all of our programs are have been recorded and are available on the Hyattsville aging in place website if you'd like to um, go to that uh, we are also I want to thank the city of Hyattsville Carter investment for the support of our programs this has been this has been wonderful. Um, I think I will start by introducing Patrick Wohan, who is the mayor of College Park, um, to, and very involved in the Lake and, Lakeland community. And then I will introduce the speakers and we'll, um, we'll get going. So Patrick, welcome. Thank you, Mary Ann. It's great to be here. It's great to see so many people, so many familiar faces. I'm really excited that you all are doing this uh, panel discussion today. I'm excited to hear from the panelists. Uh, we, in the past couple of years, we have really been focused on on, on, uh, on uh, wrapping our, our, our heads around uh, what to do to pursue restorative justice as it regards uh, the Lakeland community. And uh, there, this started really um, thanks to the effort of uh, some members of the Lakeland community uh, in particular, Maxine Gross, who's uh, one in our panel, and also Robert Thurston, um, and many other people who have continue, continuously and consistently uh, brought this, uh, brought the history of Lakeland, uh, highlighted the, the the history of the Lakeland community uh, uh, with the city, with the broader College Park community, uh, and um, raised uh, the importance of of, of addressing and. Um, uh, Responding to what the the, the legacy of uh, of restore of uh, urban renewal and what had happened in Lakeland in the 1970s and 1980s and how that continues to resonate in the community today. Uh, the uh, I won't get too much into the history of what happened because that's what we're here to uh, hear from the panel. Um, but I will just note that um, uh, that the what happened uh, in College Park's history. Uh, um, you know, happened happened then in the 1970s and 1980s, but continues to resonate uh, today. And really, the displacement that was caused through urban renewal, the the just uh, devastation of the Lakeland community, uh, um, it continues to have a strong impact today. Uh, and that is why uh, even now we it is critical that we that we take significant steps. To, to address and respond to it. Uh, the Lakeland community continues to be under threat in terms of its viability in, in, the, in the future. The Lakelanders are strong and the Lakeland community has, has, has long been strong, but there are changes going on in our community that we need to reckon with and address. Uh, in order to do that over the past year, uh, we uh, established a, a steering committee to, get to begin the process of looking into restorative justice uh, we had members of of the Lakeland community uh, participate that as well as my, myself, and and uh, we had great assistance from um, representatives from a consultant and representatives from the University of Maryland. Uh, and just in the past couple of months, months the city of College Park has established a restorative justice commission um, that we are working on uh, on making now appointments to and and filling up. Um, uh, that is based on the recommendations of the Restorative Justice Steering Committee uh, to begin the process of looking into, into uh, gathering information, gathering the, the, the data and the facts and the stories uh, and the history that we need to have um, to really uh, 
to really address the legacy of, of urban renewal in a comprehensive way uh, to get feedback and input from the greater Lakeland community of how to, how to uh, what we as a city need to be doing and what we, what we need to be engaging with partners like, the, like Prince George's County, the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission, uh, the University of Maryland uh, to, to address uh, um, the legacy of urban renewal uh, and then we will be taking, based on all that information that we pull together, um, the stories, the history, the data, uh, we'll be putting together recommendations uh, and working over the next. Our plan right now is for um, to, to engage this process uh, for at least uh, the next six years or so uh, that we will that we will take concrete steps that um, uh, will, will be necessary to preserve and and maintain uh, the, the history of and strengthen the Lakeland community into the years to come. Um, so the, um, that's uh, a little bit of an introduction of what's going on now. Um, I think there's a lot of context uh, that the panel uh, will be providing us with about how, about how we got to this, to this point and where we go from here. So um, thank you, Marianne, appreciate the opportunity to do this. And I, um, I'm glad to see so many people here interested to learn more about Lakeland. Thank you, Patrick. Appreciate it very much. And we do like the nice background as well. <laughs> um, um, Lakeland was formed about 1890 um, on what was just across the street from the uh, Maryland Agricultural College, as it was called then. And it was a thriving community. It had its own schools, its own churches, its own um, um, a flourishing community, its own businesses, which I'm, I know our, our people will, will go over with you. Um, so today I'm delighted to um, present Maxine Gross, Violetta Sharp Jones, Courtney Thurston, and Robert Thurston, who are all very active in the Lakeland Community Project um, and have been delightful for us to get to know. So um, I think, Violetta, are you up first? Yes. Okay, thank you very much and welcome. I'm Violetta Sharp-Jones. I'm a fifth generation Lakelander, member of the Lakeland Community Heritage Project, vice president and board member. I also currently worked on the restorative justice project for Lakeland. Um, I'm gonna start with my family's journey, but I want you all to walk away with an understanding that Lakeland's story is about the families that came to Lakeland. The families that came to Lakeland sometime between 1890 and they found that it was such a great place to be that they decided to stay in Lakeland and grow their families. Um, my great grandparents were Nanny and James Johnson and they came to Lakeland from Westmoreland County, Virginia. And it's important to know that they were both enslaved in Westmoreland County, Virginia, Colonial Beach. They were born around 1860 and 1861. So that was quite a, an undertaking for them to come to Lakeland, an unknown place. And they brought with them six young children also with Nanny and James came Nanny's sister and her children and several other siblings. And that's how they grew their family. Their family started there in 1890 and their family remained there through urban renewal. So it is the family structure that I think is the most overlooked part of the Lakeland community. Every household had multiple generations living in it. The photo that you're looking at now, in addition to Nanny and James Johnson, you have my parents, Lucille Giles Sharps and William Red Sharps, and the two young ones. I'm the baby on the lap, on my mom's lap, and the other is my sister, who was two years older than me. Um, we absolutely loved growing up in Lakeland. Um, Unfortunately, we didn't know to ask a lot of questions. We probably would have been able to gain a lot more information about 
the community and how it started. The other picture is one of my favorites because it just shows the generations. Um, it's Harriet Hughes is the grandmother figure that is seated there. Harriet Hughes was also very important to Lakeland. She was a nurse and a midwife. So she brought a lot of, delivered a lot of children, children in the Lakeland community. And standing behind her are three of her daughters, a grandson, and then seated below her are two adoring grandchildren. Harriet Hughes remained in the community until her death in 1946. Next slide. At an early development stage, the Lakelanders that came here in the beginning realized that one, they wanted to give thanks. So of course they started to establish their churches and pray and were very thankful for being in this new place and having the opportunity to develop a great community for their families. The two churches, First Baptist Church and Embry Church, they basically started in, in, in their homes until they were able to establish an, a building for their two churches. The two churches remain in the Lakeland community today. Those churches started in 1891 and another was built in 1903, I believe. Next. Along with establishing um, the foundation for their, their re religious beliefs, they also knew that education was the key to everything. So in 1903, there's an earlier picture, um, we'll show you a little later, of a school, the first schoolhouse that was built in Lakeland. And that was a property that was granted to them by Edwin Newman and his wife who Edwin Newman, of course, created the Lakeland community. And he granted them land in 1903, and they built the first one-room schoolhouse. And John Calvary Johnson was the trustee of that property and helped that community grow in the education field. We also had, Lakeland also had two Rosenwald schools. Rosenwald schools are schools that were established for Southern communities. Um, the seed money was put up by um, Rosenwald and then the communities worked together and they paid that money back and they, they got the schools built. Um, the out first school, Rosenwald School, was established around 1925. It was an elementary level. It had two classrooms, one through grades one through three and grades four through six. After that, you went on to Lakeland High School, which was established in 1928, and it remained a high school until 1950. After 1950, Lakeland High School then became an elementary and, and junior high, well now today it would be called middle school. So that's what happened after, 19, after 1950, and that, that remained, that school Physically, the building remains today. It is operated by a Brazilian church. However, until the 60s, it remained as an elementary school. Next slide. When the Lakelanders came, they of course had to find ways of sustaining themselves. So they did it by any means that they had. They did it through farming the land, they did it through, um, of course, a main draw for them was the agricultural college. So they worked in many capacities at the university from helping construct buildings to cooking, um, domestic services in the dorms, um, working for the fraternities, um, any, doing anything from uh, being a laundress to a helper in, in the kitchen. That was through the University of Maryland contacts. Also, the um, College Park Airport in the early 1900s was quite a, a draw for them. We had five Lakelanders that appear in this photo that worked at the airport in some capacity, either as helper, mechanic helpers, uh, mail carriers, uh, maybe grounds crew. And those five 
gentlemen that are represented in this photo, two of them come from the Brooks family, two come from the Hill family, and the other one is from a descendant of Charles, jo was Charles Johnson, who is the great-grandfather of Derby Lomax. So that gave you an idea of what kept them there. We, um, they, we had businesses in Lakeland later that we established, lots of entrepreneurial spirit. We had our own uh, grocery, not gro well, grocery stores, smaller scale, maybe what we compare to like today's 7-Eleven, uh, that type of, of um, store. We had that, we had cleaners, we had apartment buildings, we had hairdressers, we had barbers. I want people to understand that Lakeland had a full range of things that we did to sustain us, to uh, our social activities, our religious standing. All of that was important to Lakeland and all of that continued through the growth of Lakeland from 1890 until present day. Next. And like most communities, we had a representation um, for supporting the military. Um, in the 40s, you had these gentlemen, my dad, William Sharps, and Mr. Harry Braxton uh, being in World War II. Then you have uh, Joseph Johnson, who was a World War I veteran. And this later picture is one also of the Braxton family um, that came through a correspondence between, I think, their cousins. Next picture. We also had a lot of social activities. Um, I appreciate this program because it's talking about the corridor. And I like to think of that corridor as the Route 1 corridor or the Baltimore Avenue cor cor um, corridor, where we had very several Black communities along those corridors. And, and that was our, we were all connected to those communities, either biologically, through marriage, just through friendships. Um, we would go to churches in Mercury. We would go to churches in um, in Laurel. We would go to churches in North Brentwood. Um, this photo you have here of the the uh, there's a social group that Lakeland had in the 40s and 50s, and it was um, they were called the Duchess, and it was a group of women. I don't know what their bylaws said as what they were focused on, but they had a lot of social activities. And those social activities brought communities together. On this first picture that you have with the Duchess, they're standing there and obviously they're celebrating either a, a anniversary or a milestone date of the organization, or maybe it's an individual person that was celebrating. But in the background, I particularly like this photo because I can see the faces of people from the other communities, which lets me know how connected they were to each other. I see faces from Mercury and Rossville and Beltsville and Laurel and North Brentwood. They were, our, they were our family, our extended family. Then you have the Duchess, I mean, sorry, the Counts. And that again, that's the gentleman's part of this social organization that we had. And you can see how proud they were in their attire. I just love these, these photos um, to show the different things that Lakelanders participated in. Then we had Cars Beach. There was a time when we were yeah. the, only, the only beach that we were allowed to go to was Cars Beach, which was located in the Annapolis area. There was Cars and Sparrows Beach, and they were owned by two, uh, by a Black family in that area. And you would go there and uh, almost all the organizations would sponsor some kind of trip to Cars Beach during the, the beach season. Um, varying from the churches, and both churches would coordinate and have days when they would go to the beach. Um, you also had live entertainment, so people would go on their own to participate or to hear the con different concerts that they have. Um, it was just a wonderful time. Even in the 60s, we went to Cars Beach and did other activities through what I call a forerunner of Maryland Park and Planning, we call them rec centers. And they occupied us during the summer by sponsoring various trips and various activities. 
that we did. Lakelanders were also sports enthusiasts. We were part of many um, baseball teams, club baseball teams, Sandlot baseball. And we had a field in Lakeland, which is now part of the Lakeland Community Center, where it was nothing for on a weekend to see buses and just carloads of people that came in for the baseball activities of that particular day. Next picture. I think it's up to Courtney. <laughs> I guess I'll take it from here, now, Ms. Bai. I appreciate you for sharing your uh, reflections um, and insights on Lakeland with us. Um, and thank you for lending, lending an hour and ear to hear Lakeland's story. I'm honored to be here. Um, to, like many cities in the early 1960s, College Park began to launch an urban renewal project in an attempt to address inadequate housing conditions, largely caused by governmental neglect and segregation. Initiated by federal legislation passed in the late 1950s, these local projects were intended to address blight in cities and suburbs, but their implementation often resulted in the destruction of homes and displacement of many mainly African American residents. Today, I'll be sharing Lakeland's urban renewal story and how all of the things that Ms. Vi just shared with us um, tended to come to an end. The College Park Urban Renewal Authority was officially established in August of 1967. Eventually, a project area committee known as POC was formed to include Lakeland residents in the process. The group acted as a liaison between the community and the city, but is often remembered as having little authority in the urban renewal decision making process. When the urban renewal plan was finalized in 1969, the project planned to upgrade 105 acres where 137 families live in an effort to rehabilitate the area. Dozens of signs, like the one seen here, were posted to warn residents of urban renewal clearance areas. Oops. However, by 1973, administration and funding changes, as well as damage done by Hurricane Agnes in 1972, disrupted the project timeline and budget. Oral histories remember Agnes as the worst flooding in the neighborhood's history, causing damage in multiple homes, mainly in the east and central areas of the neighborhood where this picture was taken. As Lakeland's representative and the second African American to serve on the College Park City Council from 1957 to 1973, Derby Lomax advocated for adequate housing resources in Lakeland. In 1973, he ran for mayor and won. As the first and only African American mayor in College Park's history, Mayor Lomax was meant to symbolize a change in city governance. This is a flyer from his reelection campaign. He encouraged voters to expand his tenure so he could see the urban renewal plans he helped to form flourish. By the end of urban renewal in the late 1980s though, over 100 homes had been demolished, displacing many multi-generational families and transforming the landscape of the neighborhood. This map is actually two maps overlaid. The base map of the faint outlines shows the original plat map of the area Edwin Newman planned out. The second map shows all of the blacked out sites of substandard housing and shaded blighting uses, um, or all of the places that were deemed blight by the city and the developers. From this, we see how much of Lakeland's original area was actually habitable and how much blight city officials and developers saw in Lakeland. However, visual representations of the neighborhood prior to urban renewal are scarce, outside of the memorabilia of residents. The lack of documentation on Lakeland during segregation reflects the neglect the neighborhood experienced from local governments. However, the hyper-focused development documents portray city interests once private developers were involved. The development led by African Americans in this space goes largely unnoticed, except, by Af for, except for efforts of the African-American community. 
This map, included in the 1969 plan, is one of two maps available that note the structures and landscape that existed prior to destruction. However, since this map was created from the viewpoint of developers, the structures go unnamed. To community members, these structures were the home of a neighbor or relative that they could name, or a family church, or the famed high school. Without this significant detail, the map fails to portray the value of the community that thrived in this space. This map is an attempt to show what Lakeland's original area would be today. Although African Americans were systematically forced to occupy this flood prone area, the development they led, such as the churches, schools, and homes, symbolized black placemaking during segregation. Memorializing places like Lakeland are important to recognizing the development led by African American communities in segregation and their con contribution to the process, progress sorry, of our cities. Their remaining structures also remind us of how community needs were met internally by the community. Today, only a small fraction of what Lakeland once was remains. Uh, after completion of the urban renewal plan, residential land ownership was significantly decreased, and the majority of ownership went to private partners like Leon Wiener and Associates or Maryland National College Park, or Park and Planning. The Urban renewal in Lakeland is the College Park's largest mass displacement of African Americans since its incorporation. And although the city has now formally apologized for the harms, oops, sorry, for the apologize for the harms and wrongdoings, as we leave here today, I'd like us all to consider how, as we help our neighbors, we might make better decisions in how we choose to remember the past and who is included in planning the future. Thank you all so much for being here. I really appreciate you lending an hour and an ear to hear Lakeland's story. I'd like to pass it over to Ms. Maxine Gross, who will tell us about Lakeland's initiatives to preserve the neighborhood's past. Oh, I think you're still muted. I'm working on it. Thanks so much, Courtney. I appreciate all you had to present to us today. Well, I am here to talk about Lakeland Community Heritage Project and preservation efforts here in Lakeland. First slide, please. So this is giving you a little bit of a timeline. It was in 2002 that we started our very first heritage event. And that we called, um, at that time we called ourselves the Lakeland History Project. We did a a, a Lakeland history tour, produced a scholar's guide, and did an oral history workshop and, and encouraged people to start collecting um, memorabilia. And we did a, a, a little, a small collections event as part of that, those efforts. In 2008, we became a, a nonprofit organization and formally incorporated as Lakeland Community Heritage Project. In 2009, we produced the book Lakeland African Americans in College Park using um, images that were collected digitally. Um, we made the decision to collect images digitally because it was a way, an easy way for us to amass material while allowing and encouraging uh, families to keep what they already had as their family archive. Those materials lived in uh, hard drives on various uh, bookshelves and tops of closets for a number of years. They were pulled out in order to do various projects, but they weren't available to a large group of people, just the folks working within the Heritage Project, aside from those images, uh, about 200 that were put, were, um, put into the book, Lakeland African Americans in College Park. Also, a good selection of images and actual um, artifacts were displayed during an exhibit in 2009 done in conjunction with Maryland National Capital Parking Planning Commission as part of their Black History celebration. That was at Mount Pelia back in 2009. Um, 
since that time we've done we did a long line of annual events um, heritage weekend we also did events for black history month and co um, partnered with the University of Maryland for different study projects but our work really was kick-started in 2018 when we decided to focus more on the development of the of the archive as a long-lasting way to memorialize what was Lakeland we were able to to build a partnership with the uh, Maryland Institute for Technology and the Humanities, which was able to bring forward their expertise in um, really formalizing the digital archive and making it available to the general public. Um, just recently, the first elements of the archive was put online. It's at archive lakeland no archive.lakelandchp.com and you can take a look at that whenever um, your time allows in 2020 the city of college park uh, apologized for past practices and policies um, that have systematically disadvantaged black residents and particularly the lakeland community so those are some key dates or two key years that we have for, for the preservation element of Lakeland. Next slide, please. I spoke a moment ago about Lakeland African Americans in College Park. You can take out your phone now and get a link by, you know, taking a picture of the code here. And that'll take you right to a way for you to buy a, per, buy a copy of Lakeland African Americans in College Park. It's a fabulous way to get a, a wonderful introduction into the Lakeland community. And it touches on a lot of the subjects that um, Vi gave you a few minutes ago. Next slide, please. I also told you a little while ago that we've partnered with different groups to highlight the Lakeland story. One of the most unique partnerships was with this um, group of young people who form a percussion ensemble. They produced an original work called Shadows of Lakeland using various uh, modes of percussion and the voices of Lakelanders to tell the Lakeland story. And I would encourage you to, you know, take out your phone again and, and grab the link to that production. Um, it, it just tells the story in ways that words really can't. Um, it's extremely emotional. Um, it, it gives the color of, of what happened and the spirit in a way that, again, words simply can't. Next slide, please. I, I spoke uh, also a little while ago about the fact that the city of College Park um, back in June of, of 2020 stated that they were sorry for what had happened um, in their relationship with this with the community of Lakeland and one of the things that they promised was to aggressively seek restorative justice. A significant amount of time passed between that promise and concrete action. During that time, we took a number of steps to try to continue to remind the city and uh, about their promise and also increase the number of people who were aware of the Lakeland story. This is a video that was produced that utilizes material from the digital archive and was made in partnership with Lakelanders and members of the group working on the digital archive project at MIF. And so I'll ask you to take a few moments and view it with me.
Driving along US-1, you see new high-rise developments along strip shopping centers and fast food shops. Just take a turn onto Lakeland Road near the University of Maryland's North Gate, and you will find Lakeland. Maybe it would be truer to say the remains of Lakeland, the historic African-American community of College Park. Lakeland grew as a community during the time of segregation, 1865 to about 1970. Schools and houses were not desegregated in Prince George's County until very late. Then there was white flight, but those stories are for another day. Lakeland was a vibrant place with boundaries that reached from just behind the east side of US-1 across the BNO railroad tracks to include what is now Lake Artemisia Natural Area. It was a place of extended families where nearly everyone was related. These ties made it natural for people to work together to meet all types of needs, including care of the old and the young. There were homes, some large and others more modest, with huge vegetable gardens, schools, churches, a social hall, lodge building, stores, beauty shops, and baseball fields. Lakeland was a place where people lived, loved, and celebrated. So, what happened? Herbert Renewal happened. In the 1960s, Lakelanders, like many other Black residents across the nation, worked to exercise community control over their neighborhoods in resistance to housing discrimination. Following the passage of federal legislation with the promise of addressing housing inequalities, residents petitioned the city of College Park for help. The community organized in hopes of protecting some of their homes from frequent flooding, alleviating the impacts of flooding in the area and helping some improve their homes. In 1969, residents, city and county officials and stakeholders compromised on a redevelopment plan and officially made Lakeland a designated site for urban renewal. Although the federal policies were intended to improve lives of disenfranchised residents, the stories of Lakelanders who lived through this period reflect the destruction and transformation of Lakeland's landscape and community. Many family homes have been built in what government experts said were flood-prone areas. Many others were judged to be blight. In the end, 104 of Lakeland's 150 households were marked for demolition. By the end of the 1970s, most of Lakeland's residents were forced to leave and two thirds of the land was cleared. Gone is the western part of Lakeland with its homes, the American Legion Post, social hall, and stores. After standing vacant for years, it was all replaced. Gone is the eastern part of Lakeland, its historic Rosenwald School building and homes with their gardens. Gone are so many Lakeland families. Was there harm to Lakelanders? What does restorative justice mean for this community? Today, we Lakelanders are calling upon our city leaders to make good on their promise to aggressively seek opportunities for restorative justice. We must come together as a government and community and allow Lakelanders to speak out about the wrong done, the harm it caused, and set roads to restoration. Our vision is a building block for a Lakeland which is strong, healthy, safe, and inclusive. Although a great deal has been lost, Lakeland's story reflects the larger story of the African American experience in Prince George's County, as well as the larger struggles for racial equality in our nation. While we should always be inspired by the resiliency of Lakeland's generations of residents, the neighborhood's history should cause us to question which histories are truly valued and why? Now that you've heard Lakeland's story, we hope to see you soon. Thank you, Courtney. Well, the mayor spoke a little earlier about the fact that the restorative justice movement in College Park has begun. If you are interested in bec becoming part of all of that, please go ahead and use this um, link to put in an application to be a part of it all. I thank you for your time and your attention. Good afternoon.
again, thank you all for being here. Thank you, uh, Quarter Connections, for putting this on for us, the Lakeland story this afternoon. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the vision for Lakeland. Um, but first, the first couple of slides I'd like to show you um, <clears throat> is to give you an idea of present day Lakeland through a slightly different lens. Um, the prior presenters have helped the audience to understand and give some understanding of the past, but I want you to see Lakeland from the Lakelanders' point of view. Um, Lakeland is a neighborhood of dead ends. Um, as you can see with this slide here, we have one entry into Lakeland, one exit into Lakeland. Um, there are probably other neighborhoods up in the down route one that have possibly a similar scenario, but it wasn't our plan. Um, the, you can continue with the next slide. <clears throat> I show these homes here because out of all that's been mentioned about urban renewal um, in the 30 plus years that I've been here, these are these three homes that sit on Rhode Island Avenue are the only three identifiable single family homes that were replaced in Lakeland post, post urban renewal. The next slide. <clears throat> Uh, and, and by the way, I'd also say that the, the, those three homes is in those 30 plus years I've been here have also always been rental homes. Um, this slide here is just another representation of how we have one possible alternate ingress and egress into the neighborhood. Uh, many of you are aware of the alloy fire and also the recent COVID testing that took place on Route 1. Um, many of our residents uh, were either trapped outside of the neighborhood or could not return to the neighborhood. And many of you uh, may see this as kind of normal, but as I said, I would like for you to see it from a different lens from that standpoint that Ms. Vi was speaking of um, and also Courtney and Ms. Maxine when Lakeland was its own sustainable neighborhood. Uh, even when I moved in, you could still see the access that you could cross the railroad tracks and exit onto Kenilworth Avenue. So there were ways in and out of the neighborhood that the Lakeland, Lakelanders were able to provide that we have not been able to regain as far as access. Next slide. <clears throat> uh, just another slight presentation. One of the things that I've kind of learned here is about the demise of the homes in Lakeland. Um, what is considered the east side, which is Lake, now Lake Artemisia, is probably where the majority of the single family homes. And I would also like to add on that not different than many other um, Black and African American community uh, neighborhoods around the country, um, what we now consider uh, a particular plot of land um, as we've heard and seen on the news, um, sometimes that was uh, descendants living on the, on the property that was not properly maybe um, deeded. So when we talk about the, the displacement, um, we really can't just look at lots and plots because that was a different time period. Next slide. Uh, as I said, this was the east side of Lakeland. It's beautiful, uh, love Lake Artemisia, uh, but there's very little recognition or designation or understanding that that was part of the um, community. And I'll speak just a little bit about it later on, but that's also um, why it's personal to me about the redistricting of District 3. Um, next slide. <clears throat> uh, again, access to Lake Artemisia. You saw a beautiful lake um, and there has been a lot of work that's taken place. And I would say that work has probably taken majority in the last five years, but this is the Lakeland access to Lake Artemisia. Um, great that we have an access, but when you think about that that was someone's home that was part of the community, um, it can appear 
somewhat as a, uh, a continuous bad memory. Next slide. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the redistricting, if you all have seen the map, you understand how it goes. The right side of that blue line is 54th Avenue, which is currently the last active street of uh, Lakeland now, but that also means that everything to the right of it, which used to be um, the east side of Lakeland, is now part of another district. Again, not really maybe a big deal because Lake Artemisia is still there, but when you think about it from the history of Lakeland, it is just another continuous uh, reminder of uh, a past that was not part of the plan. Next slide. However, I think we are at a point where we are starting to see some realization of what we hope Lakeland can be. Um, in late 2018, early 2019, the Lakeland Civic Association um, prepared a vision statement for Lakeland. Um, it was at the time that the city and the uh, university city partnership was also looking to enhance their um, vision 2020. Um, so Lakeland provided what we would like for um, our area to be in the future, a historically designated area um, with that community thrives in. Uh, we'd like to you can go to the next slide. <clears throat> the restore of the character of the community that was mentioned before, um, the housing structure that we currently have now, um, again, is part of pre-urban renewal, and I would also say um, pre-segregation or post-segregation. So um, when we start talking about the housing stock for Lakeland, it's not really, in many cases, uh, attractive to a new or existing um, buyer for a single family home. So what we are experiencing is a different type of um, what I would call gentrification. Next slide. Um, but we are fighting hard to maintain the existence of the Lakeland community. Uh, we feel that it's still a thriving community, which you're seeing here now is one of our two uh, civic association annual events in <clears throat> the community, which is our national night out event, which we hold obviously on national night out. Next slide. <clears throat> As I mentioned before, the Lakeland vision is uh, five uh, strategic areas to help restore and revitalize the Lakeland community. Many um, or all are really um, pertaining to what I would say the city of College Park is attempting to achieve, but this is more specific to trying to bring Lakeland up to um, standard of the community. Um, transportation, education, public safety and sustainability um, are, are um, and revitalize, revitalization and redevelopment are those areas. Um, the strategic areas are pretty much the same that surround other communities and cities, um, but our initiatives are targeted towards uh, Lakeland. Next slide. Um, the initiatives that are affecting Lakeland from a positive standpoint right now are listed here. Um, many have been stated already, but I just wanted to kind of highlight uh, the CP Cups Vision 2030 has a neighborhood preservation um, goal. Of that goal is a housing trust, which is uh, um, looking to uh, try to help stabilize um, some of the neighborhood uh, activity, especially when it comes to rental, which is, as I mentioned earlier, because of the housing stock, current housing stock within Lakeland, we're seeing investors um, bid up prices and then convert what would be a single family house into a rental home, which is not a problem. Uh, I love my uh, college 
student neighbors, but once those students no longer want to live there, it's not a house that a single family uh, buyer would consider. Um, the College Park Planning and Development um, segment is, I think I mentioned earlier, but um, pre-urban pre renewal, post-urban renewal, there really isn't a uh, consistent plan for the community development of Lakeland, um, which really allows the investors the opportunity to change the housing stock, um, to say one, um, kind of prevents this, the city from really looking at the access that we have to other areas in other neighborhoods. So the planning department has since probably September when we made the request, begun to start to look at opportunities to create um, a development plan for Lakeland. Um, and also um, included in that is reimagining in that. And there are some initiatives with the University of Maryland to look at how to reimagine Lakeland with um, its existing spaces and current structures. Um, as it's been mentioned already about the restorative justice process, um, but I also wanted to mention, obviously, because one, one reason is because I'm in charge of it, but the ARP Livable Communities really is also focused on the same things that are part of the Lakeland vision. So if the ARP Livability starts to achieve its goals, then it's also going to be a positive um, for the Lakeland community. Next slide. Um, <clears throat> Just wanted to highlight again when I spoke about the uh, demise of the, the current demise of the Lakeland neighborhood. Um, what you're seeing here is a small sample of a executive summary that was produced by a um, leasing company. And the, the significance of that is this picture, next slide, as well as at least two of the pictures in this slide and I think the third one, but it's an in interior, are homes within Lakeland um, that are obviously um, part of the um, <clears throat> of this brochure and also part of the marketing strategy for rental homes. Again, um, not a concern about the student rentals or the student housing. It's more the concern of the housing stock and how it will be um, irreplaceably changed if this uh, pattern continues. Next slide. <clears throat> uh, again, I think it's a time to celebrate for Lakeland, hopefully, because we have a lot of initiatives that are, are underway. We hope that we will continue to build upon the legacy. And I think that's the most um, important thing that I've come to know about Lakeland is just how um, the folks that came here uh, made a, you know, kind of kind of made lemonade out of lemons. And I would like to continue to see that legacy continued by the community um, and its history continue to be told. Thank you very much. And I guess at this point, we will open it up for comments and questions. Thank you all so much. That was, that was fascinating. Um, and Robert, you're still on my screen, so I want to also commend you for your work with this project. But also, Robert chairs the um, AARP Livability Com Com Committee, um, which is you'll be hearing more about. And he also is president of Neighbors Helping Neighbors in College Park, along with 50 million other things that he does. Um, what a wonderful collection of photographs. They were just absolutely delightful. And I, I think the job you all have done um, to, to recreate. Oh, my. Apologies. I'm not sure what happened there, where she went. <laughs> um, uh, let's see. So if anyone has questions, you can please put them into the chat or go ahead and raise your hand. Um, and 
it looks like we've got one hand up. Uh, I'm sorry, I apologize, Aurelis, if, if you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Thank you, Ross. My question um, is from, um, from what I understood from Courtney uh, Thurston in the 1980s, um, over 100 homes, um, of those a hundred, of those 100 homes in the 1980s that were displaced, I'm just trying to figure out what restoration or what retribution has either the county or the city of College Park um, provided those, um, those families. That's a really good question, Relis. Thank you for asking it. I apologize. I was giving a uh, brief extended, a brief overview of, of Lakeland Urban Renewal, um, but there were, um, in the process, in the urban renewal process, College Park did acquire the homes, um, so residents were, um, I guess, purchased out of their homes. So there was, I guess, that bit of financial compensation, but there was no compensation for relocation, for example, um, and there has been no compensation or any financial um, compensation for um, families so far. Um, and I don't, I don't, I hope that's answering your question. To an extent, and just simply because of what I do for a living, um, I'm going to challenge that to ensure that were they really compensated true value? No. Exactly. No. Right. That, that's the point where I was going. Right. <laughs> <laughs> just so, simply because those that are on this call know what I do for a living, and, and I'm just so... Yeah, I'm that troubled child. Mm -hmm. uh, I would I would add to that, Rose, that not only, um, I mean, first, I think it was mentioned that there was a assessment. So first that assessment was devalued. And then there was also some homes that just were not considered at all because they weren't properly placed as far as on a plot and things like that. And Maxine can probably a little bit more about that. So on the assessment, was that more so a tax bill assessment or the assessment that we see through SDAT or was there a true pre-appraisal done by a legitimate appraiser of these homes? I can try to answer some of those things for you. Just to make a little bit of a, um, to give a little bit more information. The people who moved out were given two things. They were give. They were. Um, their property was sold to generally, in most instances, the city, and they were paid for that land. There's some question about whether or not it was a fair price. They were also given funds to assist them in the actual relocation. Um, of course, there's no compensation for, for things like family relationships and, and community and you know longevity and the fact that you're required to leave where you don't want to leave. Um, they were, the city did hire two or three um, appraisers to go through and appraise all of the properties. Um, the people who have looked at those appraisals question whether or not they were done in the same way they would have been done for a different population. And I'll just reflect on some things that have come out in the news kind of recently. Um, there have been instances where uh, appraisers come in the very, very recent past, you know, within months, uh, months ago, to look at a house and the black homeowner lets the person in and they look at the house and they come up with one value. Um, then the 
same house has household has the white spouse at home when they come to look at the property and they give a vastly different value. So there's that. Um, but I think anyone at the time would say to you that Lakelanders were given a fair price for their property. And we can talk about, you know, property value and the impact of, you know, racial inequity on properties and the location and on and on and on. But um, it's more complicated than just saying they were kicked out and they weren't paid for it. Um, there were ways that people could convince themselves that what they did was okay. I hope that answers the question rather than asking a whole lot more. There's a somewhat related question in the chat. Uh, where did the families that uh, left Lakeland go? Did they relocate nearby or otherwise stay connected to the community? Uh, my family left in February of 1975. We had, our home was located on the east side, which is the original part of the Lakeland community. The home was purchased in 1907 and had remained in the family for that length of time. My family opted to go to a pretty close uh, by community um, called uh, Dresden Green, which was off of um, Good Luck Road in Lanham. They went there and the family remained there until 1999 after, you know, parents were elderly and one had deceased. So then they moved on to a, a different location. But they remained there. But what was what was truly lost was their connection to a community that, in my case of my mother, she had known all of her life. Um, and as much as she tried to keep her connections to the community and to the AME church, for example, that she was uh, connected to, it became more and more difficult uh, because of where she physically was located and, and where the Lakeland community was. Um, I'll share with you that I was not living at, in the home at the time I was married and, and had moved away. However, my youngest sister, who was probably in middle school, maybe getting ready to go to high school, the, it was so devastating that she had to leave that literally she stayed in, in a cold, empty house for a few days by herself, refusing to move. She just did not want to go. So literally, her, her big sisters, we all had to, you know, gang up on her and literally drag her out of the house. And, and that's, how do you place a value on that? Um, but that was the impact that that move had on, on my family. And I will never forget that. Uh, Mayor Ollion, I see you've got your hand up. Um, and then also, if I could just ask you, there was another question if you might know from your, your work with MML, are there similar uh, movements of restorative justice in other area communities? Sure. So one thing I just want to ask, uh, I guess, about the um, the valuing of the homes, and I wonder um, in the in the time, I think it's important to note that there's a broad, that there's a broader context around this too, in that that uh, um, generally speaking, um, African American homes were systemically undervalued, um, uh, and that um, and part of that has to do with just the the uh, with redlining, with uh, um, what was considered blight there was often the result of, of systemic neglect on the part of local officials um, that they didn't, that who failed to invest in, in, in the communities. And I don't think, and, um, and maybe you can talk a little bit more about that. I'm, I'm sure that, that like we've learned about other black communities around the, around the country, Lakeland wasn't, wasn't uh, immune to that under investment. Um, that led to the flooding, the flooding that was uh, that was seen when those houses were labeled white. I think in part that was because uh, because of the systemic underinvestment in the community uh, in the Lakeland neighborhood by the by the city, by the community, by the county. Um, so maybe you can touch on that a little bit. 
um, whether you think that contributed to maybe a per, a perceive, you know, well, actual, you know, the the um, what fact that that people who lived in Lakeland weren't fairly compensated for uh, the homes that they lived in. Um, I can answer the question about the about other communities that are doing this. I do know. Um, so my I'm part of uh, um, the National League of Cities um, uh, has a program called uh, Race Equity and Leadership. Uh, the, they have staff that are, are assisting communities around the country and engaging, engaging in processes like that, like what we're doing in, in, in Maryland. There's also the government Alliance on race and equity that the city, um, that college park has been a part of over the last few years, helping us to, to, uh, uh, to connect, to navigate some of these issues. Um, uh, I can't really speak about right now about other communities in Maryland that are doing this right now. Um, but I do know there are communities around the country, like uh, um, Evanston in Illinois, which has instituted a, a um, reparations process, um, uh, and other other communities that are beginning to explore this to some extent. So, I would also um, remind everyone of Greenbelt and the fact that there was a, a valid question about whether they should engage in a reparations process. I mean, the, the Greenbelt story is quite different. African-Americans were barred from living there, period. Um, but there are somewhat similar um, conversations going on in Greenbelt. If I could just... Um add to this, there, there was some investigation of illegal codicils in Hyattsville as well by the Hyattsville CDC. I think um, Betty Dickerson just al also commented on that. Um, there were a number of so-called sundown towns in the area, Hyattsville maybe one of them, Brentwood one of them, and North Brentwood was, was considerably disadvantaged by that. Um, I don't know what the longer, broader um, investigation by the CDC is, or whether it's ongoing. I don't know if anybody else knows in the in the audience. And you can pick up some of that discussion in the original uh, video that we did with North Brentwood. That's on our on the Hyattsville Aging in Place website. I'm back. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I'm so sorry, I don't know what happened. Um, I've been accused of talking too much and I guess somebody decided it was too much. A robe took over my mouse. So I'm sorry to interrupt, but I, I did, Maxine. <laughs> no, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, I, I, did anything come through? I did wanna thank you so very much. I hope everybody else has done that. Um, that was just fascinating. And I wanted to mention um, the walking tour of Lakeland. That's, that's wonderful. Did anybody talk about that? I enjoyed doing that. And over at Lake Artemisia, we can see Dervy Lomax and a bit of the description of, um, you know, the plaque that's over there for him. Um, so that was, it was wonderful. I, I did want to go back for a minute and touch on something that the mayor um, brought out of, couple of minutes ago. And that is the fact that Lakeland has changed dramatically over time. In fact, much more than I ever realized before. Um, I've taken a little quality time and, and, and embarked on a road that um, Ms. Jones has taken, you know, some years ago and looked at the historic um, newspaper articles about Lakeland starting in um, 1890 and looking at least as far as 1945 when it became part of the city of College Park. And from that, you can see the transition from a primarily uh, Euro European American community and the landscape that is described in those articles to the 1900s and the 1920s and how it's described um, in the Afro with a lot of institutions and buildings and, and organizations that didn't exist in the memory of most of the people that are, 
alive today. And I say that to, to, to really say, I think there's a whole lot there in um, the support that the community got between the, since it was an African-American community. Um, Newman's Lakeland was very different than that that was supported in the 1940s and 50s, 60s. Um, something happened to a whole lot of things. And I don't know whether it is a, was a product of legislation or um, new types of um, relationships within various communities or exactly what happened. Um, but there were businesses here and, and um sophisticated organizations with infrastructure that by the 1960s were gone. And, and it would be a great question for someone to try to figure out how that happened and why. There was uh, another question in the chat. Uh, how close is Lakeland to getting more access with roads and streets? Mr. Mayor, I think you're on. Well, um, so obviously the 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 well the the question was um, one of the the points of access that was provided before um, was over the tracks, um, and since the metro was built, um, that's obviously a lot more challenging, uh, unfortunately. Um, uh, so trying to build a um, you know, when there was just CSX tracks, obviously they, you could go over those tracks um, and you didn't have to have a, uh, a, a, a bridge that, that had clearance. So that, that is much more challenging now than it would have been before Metro was built. The, um, the, the underpass um, that, was, that uh, Robert showed in his presentation um, that provides access to Lake Artemisia, um, that does still flood, but it has been improved significantly. We've been advocating for several years for, for that uh, improvement just to clean it up um, by the Maryland National Park and Planning Commission. So that at least has been improved. One of the things that we're still exploring um, that is challenging because it involves uh, engagement with private property um, is uh, extension of 54th Avenue uh, northward into the Berwyn neighborhood. And I know that that's something that, that Lakeland has been, has been wanting for a long time um, uh, and, um, and may require us to explore some creative options there. Um, there is a, uh, uh, a, um, uh, a business area that, um, and some parking lots that would have to be, um, that we'd have to explore about how to, what to do with those. But, uh, so that is somewhat, somewhat challenging to recreate that access, but, um, but it is something that I would like to continue to look at. And I think it'd be part of the discussion, um, about how we provide access, um, from, from automobile access from, um, Lakeland into, into Berwyn. Yeah, you know, I would just point out that there may be other opportunities um, for providing that access. I know, you know, just off the top of my head, there's Ash Street, there's Rhode Island Avenue. Um, it, you know, those are other options as well. And you, there's also, there are other communities um, adjoining Lakeland um, as well as Berwyn. Um, there was a, a streetcar that ran along Rhode Island Avenue. There's that right away that connects College Park um, and Berwyn. So, you know, I don't have an answer, but I think there is opportunity there. With the, uh, the mention of the streetcar, there was a question in the chat as to whether or not the, the demise of the streetcar played any role in the timing of the urban renewal or, or other um, impact on the Lakeland community that that might have had, just if anyone knows. The, the timing um, is a bit off, um, what, 19, right around 1960 is when the streetcars stopped running. I think the decision to discontinue service may have 
had some interesting sources. Um, you know, you, if you do a little bit of reading about urban renewal and highways and the the isolation of, of communities um, and the the whole concept of of mass transit in the United States, a lot of the reasoning for those things but for the United States having viable mass transit is a way to um, isolate communities. Um, and, and I don't know how many of you, and probably a few of you were here at the time that, um, that WMATA was trying to build the, the Metro line. There was a huge conversation about um, what groups of people would be given access if um, there was good mass transit uh, from the city. So I think those conversations were likely have, to have taken place back then as well. Um, so although not directly, I think it was an impact. And then you think about the fact that up until the time uh, the streetcars left, it was extremely easy for someone to get on a streetcar on Rhode Island Avenue and go downtown to work. Where once that was no longer in place, transportation was significantly more difficult and more expensive because you had to buy a car. And buses were not as frequent as the streetcars and on and on and on. No, I just, um, Marianne, I'd just like to comment on um, Maxine's comment about the metro. I do remember those conversations about putting the metro stops in different places. Um, you know, Hyattsville ended up with two stops, which we were very happy about, but there was, I was very happy about, but there was a considerable discussion about, yeah, who would, who would be coming out to this area and what did that mean and what did it mean to the Prince George's Plaza and all of those, um, all of the shopping areas. So I, I just want to comment on that. I think, um, I don't know. I don't know if there are any other questions, Marianne. I don't see any. Um, I just, again, if it's a repeat, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, thank you all so much. This was just fascinating. I certainly encourage um, anybody in the audience to take advantage of applying to the Restorative Justice Commission. I think there's a lot of work to be done, but a lot that we can contribute. So I would um, encourage that. Um, and I want to invite you to the next uh, couple of corridor conversations. The next one is March the 26th, which is the fourth Saturday in March. And that will be the political and the personal, the poetry of women's liberation, of women's liberation movement by Deborah Rosenfeld, who many of you may know. She lives in the community and is a professor emerita at uh, the University of Maryland. And it's in honor of Women's History Month. So, um, and then on April 23rd, um, come after lunch because we're having Tim Carmen, who is one of the food editors for the Washington Post. And he's gonna talk about um, what it is to be a food critic. And he's going to talk about some of the restaurants in the Route One corridor and his recommendations and how he comes up with them, things like that. I think that should be fun. And then um, May 21st uh, is an art-focused conversation with Raquel, Raquel Keller, who also is a local artist. And I think um, you, will, you will find that uh, equally fun. And I just put in the chat, um, uh, Robert Thurston is president of Neighbors Helping Neighbors. And um, they, will, they are having a meeting tomorrow that you would all be welcome to. Uh, it's a Zoom meeting at 1 o'clock. And I put the information in the chat. So I thank Can you I, all for coming. Marianne, let me ask yeah. something. Um, um, uh, Carol Nesso put in the chat that February 14th was the deadline for the restorative justice group. That is, has that been extended? That, that has been extended, I, yes. Yeah. So, what's the deadline now? Um, the end of March. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not okay. entirely certain, but it's open. So, um, thank so you. if you're interested, please apply. I think I read today, March 21st at 
Okay, have a wonderful rest of your weekend, everybody. Thank thanks you so for much. Participation and All thanks right. so much to you, Lakeland. That was fabulous.